I have another poem. It's written by a young woman. Um, she could be a graduate coming out of Naropa, but she wasn't. It was a little college in the East. Shearston, George Edelgas. A warrior has no safety net. Catches this uncertainty and risk that calls us alive. I walk on the precarious edge of the new and the old, wanting to shed the locks and lies of a mechanical world, eager to dive into the smooth, cool water of abundant life. I am young. I am a woman. I live in a land where I can choose. There are disco lights and magnetic forces pulling me into the tunnel, the tunnel where everyone goes, almost everyone. It vacuums up mall shoppers and telemarketers, executives and bartenders. It promises clean sheets and Mickey Mouse vacations, automatic garage doors and cell phone communications. If you choose the tunnel, you will never have to be cold or hungry or alone. There are pills to ease headaches and drinks to drown heartaches. There are movies to make you laugh and cars to move you fast. If you don't like your face, surgery will change its shape. There's no need for God. The tunnel will keep you safe. But if you stop believing, Oh, if you stop believing, the tunnel will disintegrate and leave you swimming in a septic tank. My choice is clear. I always cry at this part. Will you cry too, please? <laughs> I don't want to be the only one. <laughs> I know I'm not. My choice is clear. I am stepping slowly into the open, quiet land beyond. There are, there are no roads, no maps, no guides. There is no insurance coverage, no training school. Edible vegetation is sparse. Rain trickles down my back as I fumble with reeds to make a hat. Through the mist, I catch a thread of song. And I rise to see a band of barefoot sisters approach with open arms. With nothing more than faith and grace, our dance has just begun. How many noble truths? You should know that there's one more. Fourth noble truth, that there is a path, there's a way, there's stuff we can do and path not just for you to walk alone, but for you to join your brothers and sisters on to the freedom. Here's where we find liberation Buddhism. It's a phenomenon of our time. Just in my root tradition of Christianity, liberation theology goes back to the revolutionary teachings of the founder. So in liberation Buddhism, as I've seen, in Sarvodia and elsewhere, uh, I, uh, going back to the revolutionary teachings in the uh, words of the Lord Buddha. And uh, there's the traditional listing of the path, characterized by right view, right aspiration, right action, right mindfulness, right speech, right, etc. But there are two things in all of this two aspects that I want to stress. And that is, the Buddha said it about the path. Shila, moral action on the path. Shila, what you do. 
Prachna, how you wake up. Wisdom. And he says, see, that's why there has to be a path. You can't just stay on the cushion. <laughs> Meditation and action are like two hands washing each other. So you think of that next time you wash your hands or every time. Because one feeds the other. It is in acting that we wake up and find out what we're made of. That we're made of relationships, that we're made of connection, that we flow, as the, like the poet said. That... Thank you. <laughs> and as our take action and let it uh, wash our minds, uh, each step becomes a discovery. You don't know what it's going to be. You're going to find out something about who's there with you, about your own courage. You wouldn't have guessed about your own wits and creativity. The action washes your heart mind into new, clears the eyes so that you can see something unsuspected. Your own appetite for adventure. You thought you were comfortable. You thought you were protecting a comfortable life. And now you want to come alive. What I've also thrilled with here and that's taking place in uh, Boulder is the uh, Rocky Flats a Nuclear Guardianship Project. And uh, here, this is truly, when you, it's paying attention to the uh, contamination left at the Rocky Flats bomb factory. Uh, you know that here, just on the edge of town, uh, plutonium pits were made for every single warhead in the American arsenal. All were crafted out here. Well, of course, we're human, so accidents occur, leaks occur, fires occur and there was spreading and dissemination of the most lethal S element or known to humanity, plutonium. One microgram can do you in. It lasts a quarter of a million years. Once it's done you in, it can go to someplace else. It's, we are faced with something so huge. And the Nuclear Guardianship Project which is having a series of lectures here, co-sponsored by Naropa's Environmental Leadership Program, with a wonderful array of speakers. I went to one the night I arrived uh, here in Boulder on burrowing animals in <laughs> Rocky Flats. The earth is alive, you know. So the plutonium travels. And uh, and it invites us to, it's like the, it's so much in this crisis, it becomes our spiritual teacher. And I can almost hear it, the plutonium, whether it's in Fukushima, or now spewing out of Fukushima, or Chernobyl, or here, saying to us, you made me because it is man-made, you know. You brought me into existence. Don't abandon me. Watch me, please. Pay attention to me, please. And it's not that expensive or complicated to pay attention to the plutonium. The danger is when we think we can stick it somewhere out of sight and out of mind. But if we dare use the tools of mindfulness, I think there's nothing more useful for nuclear guardianship than the disciplines of mind and attention that the Lord Buddha taught. Then he says, the plutonium says, if you will just look at me, I will be your teacher. 
I will teach you faithfulness. I will teach you attention. I will teach you devotion. I will make you wise. So the nuclear guardianship project isn't quite that highfalutin. That's me talking. They'll say, we've got to stop the fish and wildlife, have a plan to turn this over into recreational area. We're going to stop that. There's going to be Jefferson Parkway along the windward side. We're going to stop that. They don't have to get as highfalutin as I can get. It's a uh, doorway, and I, this, I want to close with this and with the invitation that is there for us to expand our experience of time. The Industrial Growth Society is accelerating time. It's imprisoning us in short-term thinking about how fast. If market forces do that, technology does that. We have to attend to the profits of this quarter compared to the last quarter. We can't think about sustainability or whether we have to grab our profits now. Short-term thinking and technologies that speed everything up. And it's just now that when this is almost getting crazy making is actually that we have this uh, invitation to uh, in the great turning and in the shift in consciousness to open our awareness to uh, the big time, the deep time. This is both a spiritual revolution and a scientific one. Science is bringing data of our new cosmology and with thinkers like Thomas Berry and Sister Miriam McGillis and countless others including like Rilke in a poem, that we are seeing our journey through time. We are recognizing that we, the life in us extends deep into the past and into the future. And when you look at how long the life has been around that is right at this moment, beating our hearts and breathing our lungs, then we can wake up to how, what our true age is. And we can begin to act our age. Which just as Earth, if you want to act your age as Earth, four billion years, act your age as the universe because every particle in your body goes back to the first splitting and spinning of the stars. That's how old you really are. So when you go to stand up to the fish and wildlife or the uh, developers in plutonium strewn land or any other issue that you want to take, don't do it as if you're out of your own personal nobility or piety or wonderfulness. You're doing it with the authority of your 14 billion years. <laughs> <laughs>